Today we'll talk about the spiritual path, the mechanics of the spiritual path. What is the spiritual path? The spiritual path is one that takes us to the spirit within, unfolds that divinity, unfolds, uncovers our real self. We do not know what our original nature is. This attempt systematic attempt that we undertake to uncover our real self is what the spiritual path is all about. In fact, that's what the word, word religion says. Religion comes from two words, re ligare. Re means again. Ligare means to join. So to join from something that we have separated, but to join again means we were there at one point. Re ligare, religion, to join again to that which we have separated from our own internal real self. The word yoga also comes from the same basic idea. Yoga derives from the root yuj. Uh, yuj also means to join. So yoga, religion are all talking about the same idea which is joining again, joining to our own real self. So if it is our real self, then why are we separated? What is the what, why am I not myself right now? What's, what, is segre what is segregating it? What is the reason I don't know the self? The reason I do not know myself is because there is a barrier, a barrier of desires between me and my original nature. Since this barrier exists, I am not able to see myself for what I am. And if you take a look at all the religions, you will find that desire has been personified as this barrier between man and God. In Hinduism, it is known as the Asura. In Christianity, it is Satan. Mohammedism calls it Shaitan. The Zoroastrian religion refers to it as Angre Manyu. Buddhism has Mara. These forces, the force of desire, is supposed to be the barrier between man and God. You make an attempt to go to God and what comes in your way will be these evil satanic forces as it were, nothing other than our own desires. So desire is the barrier between me and myself, God. So then obviously the spiritual path is a matter of removing these desires. Now here's a problem. How does one go about removing desires? Is it possible to remove desires? Can this ever happen? If a person wants something, can you tell him not to want it? Sounds impossible. How can a person wanting something be told you should not want it? And even if he is told he should not want it, what can he do about it? He wants it. Can any man have this capacity to take out a desire, pluck it out and throw it away? Impossible. No man wanting anything cannot want it. If he tries, all he will achieve is strengthening the desire or frustrating the desire. One of the two. So there is no way for us to take out these desires and pluck it away. Suppose a man thinks to himself, I will not think of money, I will not think of money, I will not think of money. What is he thinking of? Is his thoughts not still on money? So there is no way to actually 
go to a desire and say, I won't have this desire, I'm going to throw this desire out. It's not possible. In fact, there's a very nice story in the um, uh, scriptures which talks about this phenomenon. Uh, there was a man who was uh, losing his hair. So he goes to a Swami and he tells the Swami, in great secrecy of course, he requests an appointment and in very secrecy, in great secrecy, he goes and tells the Swami, Maharaj, I've come to you. Please don't tell anyone my problem. So the Maharaj says, okay, I won't. What beta is your problem? So he says, you know, Maharaj, I'm a little embarrassed to tell you. No, beta, say, what is your problem? Maharaj, I'm losing my hair. Oh, beta, is that the only problem? You're losing your hair. It's very simple. I'll give you a mantra. You repeat this mantra and your hair will grow. You'll have wondrous hair. Like Madhubala you'll have if you want. Just say this mantra and you'll have hair. Oh, is that so? Please, Maharaj, tell me this mantra. I'll tell you, beta, here is the mantra. And he tells them the mantra. And this man is so delighted to have got this mantra. He falls at the Swami's feet and says, thank you, I'll ever be indebted to you. And he's leaving. So the Swami says, hold it. Yes, Maharaj. See, beta, this is a very powerful mantra which I've given you. But you have to remember one thing. When you... As you do this mantra, you have to chant the mantra every morning for at least three weeks to see some results. But then after that, you'll see fantastic results. And yes, Maharaj, I'll chant it every morning. Um, every morning, I'll do it three weeks, no problem, and I'll keep on doing it. Uh, okay, that's great. One more thing. When you chant the mantra, or from the time you wake up till the time you chant the mantra, in your chants of the mantra, remember not to think of a monkey. If you think of a monkey, if you see a monkey, if you think of a monkey, the power of this mantra will go away. So get up in the morning, don't think of the monkey, say your mantra, repeat it, and as long as your repetitions go on, don't think of the mantra, or don't think of the monkey, and in three weeks, great hair. A very simple Maharaj, I'm sure I can do this with your grace, I'm sure I'll manage, and I hope, and I know for certain that I would have my hair back. But of course, Beta, please go and do it. So this man was very excited. And he got up the next morning with great enthusiasm to chant the mantra and start this process of his hair growing back. So, but the moment he opened his eyes, monkey, sort of monkey came. Now, can't chant the mantra this morning. So, Samai got through the day. Next day, he got up, he brushed his teeth, he sat down, monkey, again thought of monkey came. Like this, he went on for a week, but there was no way. Some days he'd get it as soon as his eyes open. Sometimes the thought would come when he's chanting the mantra. He just could not obtain the chant of the mantra without the thought of the monkey. So he went back and told the Maharaj, Oh Maharaj, why did you tell me not to say, think of a monkey? In any case, I would not have thought of a monkey. This is our life. I tell myself, I'm not going to think of this. I'm not going to think of this. And that is the thought that will come. So there's no point saying, I'm not going to think of this desire, I'm not going to want this. If you do that too much, that thought will come even more. So there is no way a person could possibly get rid of a desire in this manner. And if you can't get rid of a desire like this, what are you supposed to do? Some people say, the way to get rid of a desire is, you know what? Stay away from all things. 
don't keep things around you. Because if you have things around you, you will be tempted, don't go anywhere close. Don't meet anyone, don't meet anyone, don't go anywhere, don't go into the mall, Baba. Don't do anything. Just stay at home. And that way desires will go. But unfortunately, that's not the way desires will go. That is the way desires may get suppressed in our system. And if you suppress them too much, all that results out of it is frustration. Even if you don't arrive in this state of frustration, what have you done? All that you have achieved is that the desires lie under the surface. That's all that has been achieved. They are very much there. The moment a conducive environment comes about, back they are. Just as all these western ghats on our way to Lanavla, they are so brown in April. But when the rains fall, the whole thing becomes green. So what is the use of this kind of thing? That temporarily it appears to us that we have got rid of everything. But it's actually there, very much there, lying just before the surface, ready to come out at the first hint of rainfall. So a lot of people think that abstinence is going to help us get rid of desires. Abstinence cannot help us get rid of desires. Because of abstinence, desires can get suppressed. Because of abstinence, a person can get frustrated. But in any case, the desire remains. The desire does not go just because at the moment it is not manifesting, not expressing. So the first thing people try to, as a method of removing desires, is abstinence. Abstinence doesn't work. Tadapina munchati asha vayu, he says, Shankaracharya says. Even then, the asha vayu, the flow, the stream of desires, doesn't end. And then some people have a different philosophy. They say, no, no, abstinence is a very bad thing. What is the use of abstinence? If you have abstinence, then what happens? Desires are under the surface, that's about it. Abstinence is a terrible thing. If you have the desire, go all out. Indulge. Do whatever you have a desire for. If you like screaming, scream. If you like shouting, shout. If you like whatever you feel like doing. I don't want to mention all the things. Whatever you feel like doing, go ahead and do. And by that process, your desires will go away. This is one other way of trying. No, not trying. I mean, you don't need to try all these various methods. We can understand through logic whether a method will work or not. So another way of trying it is indulgence. Go all out. Now, when you go all out, what happens? Most likely, two things. Either one, the desire is inflamed. Or two, you get neutralized towards that particular object. In fact, there's this man, you know, he, he really believed this theory you know, that by indulgence I'll get rid of desires. So what he did was very interesting. What all ideas people come up with. He had a weakness for drinking. So one long weekend, one Friday, he sent his wife and children away to her mother's house. And there are some pretext he sent them away. And bought crates, crates, literally crates of whiskey to the house. And he as soon as they left, he started drinking. And he drank and he drank and he drank. And by the time his wife and kids back, came back on uh, Monday, he was so fed up with that drinking, so nauseated with that drinking, he said, never in my life I'm going to touch this horrible thing. And whatever bottles were left, he actually opened it and poured it down the drain. So nauseated with it. He just drank the whole weekend. And he found, this is great. I have absolutely no desire for drinks anymore. And this went for, on for a week, two weeks, month, two months, three months, six months later, mm, again it came up, one drink. 
you can get nauseated with it for a short while maybe. Maybe for a short while you feel, okay, I've had enough. But the desire is still there through indulgence. You cannot get rid of a desire. It's not possible. If it was possible, why not just recommend indulgence? In fact, why do we need to recommend indulgence? So many people are doing it anyway. We can just watch and learn from other people's experience. By indulging in drugs, will you get rid of the desire for drugs? By indulgence in alcohol, has anyone gotten rid of the desire for alcohol? You don't get rid of anything by indulging in it. So, you don't get rid of it by abstinence. You don't get rid of it by indulgence. Then what? Ah, moderate life. If you live a good moderate life, everything will be all right. Unfortunately, desires cannot be get gotten rid of in that manner either. Many people live a good moderate life. They are good people, generally speaking good people. They go to their temples and churches and mosques, they do charity. Um, Bhaja Govindan talks about this, these people who are living this good life. In fact, these three verses are from the Bhaja Govindam where first he talks about abstinence and says it doesn't work through abstinence. Tadapina munchati asha vayuhu. Even then, the asha vayuhu, the flow of desires doesn't go. And then with indulgence also, he gives an example of a man who is a ripe old man. He's indulged so much in this world that he's lost everything. Even then, the desires are still there. Even though he, all his teeth are dashana vihina, even though all his teeth are fallen, all his hair has fallen, he's gone old, the desires are still there. And then he gives a third example of a person who is doing uh, good activities, so generally good, you know, going to the temples, churches, or mosques, or going on pilgrimages, and uh, doing charity, and living a moderate, good life, as it were and says, it doesn't work like this. Not through a good moderate life, because if it was possible through a good moderate life, then you should just see people who are older people who've lived good moderate life, have the desires gone? The desires have not gone. The bulk of desires are very much there. Sometimes they merely change form, but the desires are still very much there. So not through abstinence, not through indulgence, not through a good um, moderate life. By this time you're probably fed up and say, you know, I don't think it's possible. No, actually it is possible. There is a way, a proper technique to do this. There is only one way to get rid of desires. Firstly, let us understand what is a desire. A desire is nothing but a thought flow. Thoughts flowing in one direction is a desire. So, which is the way of getting rid of desires? How does one get rid of desires? There is only one way to get rid of desires. You can get rid of desires only after you experience the joy of a higher desire. By picking up a higher desire, automatically the lower desires wane away. Nobody can take a desire and throw it out. But what we can do is inculcate a higher desire. When we inculcate a higher desire, when we get the enjoyment of the higher aspects of life, the lower ones do not interest us anymore. Just as if you develop a taste for, let us say, classical music, then the lower forms of music are not interesting to you. If you develop a taste for classical literature, would you read? the more lower forms of literature, you're not interested. You're not interested, why? Not because you're very super, you know, you take a very snobbish stance, but because those lower objects are simply not giving you as much joy as the higher objects are giving us. So when we start enjoying something higher in life, the lower simply wanes away, simply falls away. Just as when you step up on a ladder, you can't leave your foot off the lower rung. What you do is you put your foot on the higher rung and then the lower will fall off by itself.
if you take a flower, you cannot pluck its petals. You won't get anything out of that. But if you allow the fruit to emerge, the petals will drop off by themselves. So when we start enjoying higher things in life, the lower ones simply wane away, simply drop away. Now the question is, how do you get the higher desire? Remember what a desire is. A desire is nothing but a flow of thoughts. So how do you get the higher desire? Try and think of something higher and higher. The lower currently is giving me joy. Why is it giving me joy? Because I've invested thoughts in it. Since I've invested thoughts in it, when I get that object, that object has appealed to me. Now what should I do? I invest these thoughts in something higher. When I first do that, no joy will come to me. That is when people give up and go back to the lower things. But go on investing thoughts in the higher. Keep on thinking about it. Just as we have gained joy in the lower by thinking about it, we will gain joy in the higher by thinking about it. And when you get these higher joys, when you teach yourself to enjoy better things, to actually enjoy them, the lower ones will simply wane away. Only thing we have to remember in this process is higher and lower are relative terms. So when you move from x to x plus 1 through this method, what is the method? Invest your thoughts in the higher. Think of ways of investing your thoughts in the higher. How can you keep your thoughts on the higher? There are various ways uh, prescribed in the Shastras. The four yogas is the way you invest thoughts in the higher. So, invest thoughts in the higher. Keep on making that investment. Even though there is no joy in it, keep on making that investment. Slowly, the joy will come. Then the problem starts. Ah, you thought this was the solution? No, then the problem starts. The problem is that when you have invested in your, th your thoughts in this x plus 1, the higher, we tend to stay there. But this higher that we have now got is lower compared to x plus 2. So we have to now Having started to enjoy x plus 1, we have to then go higher and then go higher and then go higher and we have to remember that this process has to continue for the rest of our lives till we reach that final point of self-realization. The problem is that at some stage or the other, we settle down, we say, I am happy now. Yes, I used to think of lower things and I was very miserable. Now I think of higher things and I'm very happy. But please remember that we have only improved the situation. We have not perfected the situation. We will perfect the situation only when we reach the highest point, which is the recognition of our own true self. But by going through this process, keep on taking up higher and higher and higher until you reach the one thought of the self. So how do you distinguish between the higher and lower? How do you know which is higher and which is lower? Anything which caters to a few is lower than something which caters to the wider. So when I consider just myself, higher than that is my family, to consider my family. If I'm considering my family, if my attachments is to my family, then higher would be the wider community. If I've already come to the level of the wider community, then maybe nation. If I'm at the level of the nation, then humanity. If I'm at the level of the humanity, that's where my thoughts are, then why only humanity? Why not all living beings? So like that, we keep on increasing our circles of identification. Our thoughts are on higher and higher things and never resting, never settling down, never saying, okay, I've reached it now. We haven't reached that highest point until we have relocated the divinity within our own self.
that point of self-realization where you come to the very highest point, the last point, where which is the merger with God. Different people call it different things. It doesn't matter what you call it. But we come to that stage of reaching the very highest, of reaching perfection in a human being. The state that was reached by all the great sages and prophets. Rama, Krishna, Buddha, Muhammad, Mahavir, Christ, Zarathustra, all the great sages and saints have reached these, this highest pinnacle of human perfection. How? By finding the self within themselves. And how was that done? By eradicating all desires. And how was that done? By gaining higher and higher desires. And by gaining higher and higher desires, until we have gained finally the desire for self-realization, and drop that desire and merged with the self and then we reach that final point of human perfection. The very purpose for which we have been born, the very reason for this human embodiment. <laughs>